Speaking of things that might change, one of the big the big news this week in terms of changing the sport was the uh, the Reuters exclusive. This is their second exclusive. They seem to be getting the the leaks or the news on this. Uh, their headline is Saudi Arabia closes in on deal to create new cycling league uh, hyphen sources. Now that's you, you but. <laughs> Uh, they're not very clear. I'm not saying they should name their sources, but they don't even really name like where those sources come from. Uh, like whether they're from a team from PIF. Anyway, the potential investor is an investment firm, according to them, owned by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, PIF. So yeah, essentially uh, Saudi Arabia's public money called SRJ Sports Investments, which was... Uh, they basically created as a, as a subsidiary of that investment fund to focus on sports. So it's going to be specialized in uh, investing in sports. Uh, and the potential investment is supposed to be 250 million euros, which, what is that number? When you hear that number, what do, what do you th think, Benji? I think that's not that much. Yeah, exactly. I agree, right? Like, to be clear, I'm not earning 240 million. I will never in my life earn close to that amount. But never say never. I really doubt it. <laughs> Podcasting, who knows what could happen? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> but I will say, if we take a look at, first of all, the cost that teams have right now when it comes to budgets, if you put the budgets of all teams together, you already got an amount that is larger than that, I reckon, or close to that, or rel roughly World around two that. Teams? World Tour teams. What was the average it came out? Like 25 mil, 28, 27 mil? Yeah, 25 to 28 mil. So that times 18 yep. is higher than 240 if my basic maths is correct. Yep, they, that number's right there, yep. But it's not necessarily... That's not necessarily the equation that we need to make. It's how much is it going to cost to set up the system that they want to set up, which is basically a breakaway league. Well, zero. The, the cost to set that up. Yeah, you just do crits around uh, track and Riyadh. <laughs> I fear that it's going to be more than just zero crits around Appledorn <laughs> or something. Luke will uh, be happy around the area. <laughs> but no, I agree to your point. Like, it actually is not as much money as I thought. Now, I don't know what the... Because, like, the live, the fund for the live... Because we're always comparing this. This is, like, to live. So, like, live golf. They wanted to get a seat at the table with the PGA. And so they got this huge pool of money and they uh, they basically bought up big golfers and then the PGA said, if you go to live, you can't do the master. I can't, so you can do the master. You can't play PGA events. And they were getting guys on 100 milli contracts uh, and they're getting multiple guys. So like the, that pool was way bigger. Eventually, the PGA, after saying you'd be banned, a year or so later, caved in despicable fashion and merged with uh, Liv. So, so they basically just folded after the Saudis burned cash. Question number one. You're saying that in Liv Golf, they basically paid for golf players to play in their league. Yeah, playing in, in Mickey Mouse League, yeah. The teams are part of setting up this project. so. I would guess that you're not necessarily directly paying them. Aren't they just getting a share of the revenue in the idea of the setup? Well, this is where it gets tricky. So we're going to deep dive into this. So this article, so Richard Plucker gave an interview with someone. I, I want to, Luke will look it up. He didn't exclude, radio, radio cycling, radio cycling last, in the last month. And he spoke about the one cycling project and that sounded like a broader all stakeholders involved or at least he, he seemed to that was what he seemed to want with ASO, RCS, the relevant stakeholders. This article is saying it's eight teams no ASO no RCS don't know about Flanders Classics and I very much doubt the UCI is involved in this. So what does that mean? Yeah. What would happen? Get this pool of funds, 250 mil, eight teams. Still don't know if that's worth it because that's only like 
30 mil a team and that's probably the teams we're talking about are Ineos and and Yam and Visma so um it's not the the lower budget teams but let's let's keep working with the hypothetical they go over the UCI says you're banned from world tour events because you joined this breakaway league step number one now Brunil yep. said in his pod on the move that he, he analyzed the European Court of Justice or whatever decision that said that's anti-competitive, which it is, because uh, that got struck down when another feder sports federation tried to do that or pull that sort of stuff. Anyway, UCI probably would do that. And then the riders, now that their World Tour team, so their World Tour team has now had its World Tour license cancelled because the UCI just said, fuck you. The riders can now terminate their contracts with the World Tour team because a condition in the model contract, which you can't contract out of, is that when a World Tour team contracts with you, if they lose their World Tour status, you can terminate your contract, which no one did when Israel and Lotto got relegated. So that just makes this really complicated because if you're Vingegaard, Benji, or yeah. let's say you're Vingegaard, you're probably already getting paid pretty well, you want to do the Tour de France, your team decides it wants to do this new league. And then it goes and does that. You don't want to do it. The team's getting the money or getting paid because it has Jonas Vingegaard. And then the UCI, you can then cancel your contract and then sign with one of the teams that hasn't gone to yeah. the breakaway league. So it's really difficult. It's not like with golf, with privateers. Yeah. It's, it's a very complex system. And you're right about the the European Court of Justice thing, I'm pretty sure that was about the the Super League in football. Yes, yes, where yes. Where it was initially basically said set it was aside. play on. Yeah, and, and then it was decided play on, and then I think the sports management company behind it said that it would be trying to relaunch the competition late 2022 as a consequence of that European Court of Justice decision to, uh, to basically a ban on... People that compete in the other league to compete in yours, that was uncompetitive and so forth. So, but there's just so many aspects to this. And there's been so many rumors like this in the past where, from a basic perspective, as someone that's been following cycling for the last, whatever, 15, 17 years, something like that, gradually increasing, obviously. And when I was 10, I wasn't a hardcore cycling fan yet. But throughout that period, you get used to this calendar that we have. You get used to the system that we have at the moment in, in our heads as somewhat traditional cycling fans, because most cycling fans are like, ooh, we like how it's working right now. It's going to be like, ooh, this is a change. This is scary. Because what will this do to the setup we are currently having? We've got the Tour de France, Giro, LBL, Flèche Wallon, all these ASO and RCS races. How will this extra calendar next to that impact those races will aso at any point even remotely be annoyed by that that breakaway league existing outside of that which will basically be a a racing league outside of those currently existing big races is how i perceive it and when i look at that i'm thinking why would a rider be interested in a top rider be interested in riding that league, if it comes at the cost of the other races, so I yeah, see got to be getting paid. A sh they got to get be getting paid three, four x. Yeah, that's where the twenty two hundred forty million is going, man. <laughs> yeah, but that's that doesn't seem enough because yeah. they put a they they spent a hundred mil to acquire a minority stake in the United States Professional Fighters League, which yeah. I didn't know what that is. That ain't the UFC, by the way. Is some that's, I don't, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I like MMA and boxing, but PFL is not the biggest thing. And they're only got 2.5, 2.7x more money for a cycling league with the best riders in the world for a much, much bigger sport. MMA, UFC, let's say, is, you know, more profitable, more revenue, but um, the PFL certainly doesn't. So I is don't see those not numbers adding up. Is that not the thing where Jake Paul is like promoting PFL? Uh, uh, he's trying uh, to get, I think he's trying to get extra fighters in that or something relative to the other. But yeah, I agree to, to your point, but it's like, 
it's like there's still so many questions unanswered. And yeah, also, that's... if you take a look at the Reuters article, only eight teams will, are, are involved without ASO RCS. Documents expected to be signed in the next two months. But then on the <laughs> other end, it's saying, sources yes. say there's nothing concrete yet. And talks are still ongoing. And I'm like, you can't have both. They aren't going to solve these questions in two months, I reckon. So, I don't know, man. That's what I, I, re I see the, the title of the article. But, and then and then I read like the first two paragraphs. I'm like, holy fuck, is this happening next month? Like, yeah, is this not? And, and then you scroll down. You're like, oh, it's it's not progressed at all since the previous exclusive article. It sounds like CVC partners just might not have bid because depends how you look at it. Like, yeah, whether the Saudi subsidiary won a competitive auction or was the only mm -hmm. bidder i don't know uh it's, it's unclear it's it's written like they won a competitive auction but if and you also compare so the end game would be if you think the end game's the same as in golf where they acquire a stake in the pga then the end game is to get on a stake in aso right and rcs uh, yeah but I don't have the feeling that ASO will ever be okay with having. It's a, it's yeah. like a super family built company, and they, it's they said so, that recently in public. They get, they and they're work. going good. Exactly. Yeah. And in addition to that, how if you look at the situation outside of the investment from PIF, the setup of this is starting to look a lot like the Hammer series was. As in races outside of the current calendar, held by a third party that is not in the sport yet necessarily, where the teams have a say in. Yeah. <laughs> it just depends. So, like, if the league can go side by side with the UCI calendar and the UCI don't yeah. and ca or can't blacklist you, then the money kind of makes sense because you can essentially, that's just bonus prize money then yeah but uh, and they can still do the tour and everything that's the problem with the leak as well the thought behind it is that you then have the best riders at the best races no the the biggest riders at the same races in that league is the view that comes out with not overlapping races but you're destined to overlap with the existing calendar if it's in addition to the already current existing races if aso and rcs are not involved then all these tiny organizers, the organizers that are organizing the Giro del Veneto, the Italian classics, uh, the one that won Belgian chat GPT races, like all those other races will still be happening. And I just don't... I would like to see something like this in action for one year just to see what it's like. Oh, yeah, give us a lot to talk about. But what could happen is but everyone how? just does the tour... And the big, big races. Yeah. And then they spend the rest of the season earning much bigger prize money in a separate calendar. Also a question. With all these Middle Eastern races that exist, like UAE Tour, like, like Sharjah Oman. Tour, like Oman, like um, Saudi Tour, I don't know what the relation is between those countries to the point that will the UAE Tour... Will UAE be happy with the situation that a Saudi-backed one cycling is starting? Or will they start... Is there a fight between Middle Eastern countries in sports? As in, is there a fight between hosting a UAE tour, hosting an Oman, hosting a, a Saudi tour? To the point that we might then see other Middle Eastern countries with, with money showing up and saying, oh, we want to host something like that as well. I mean, maybe they join the... I'm not, I'm not sure... Um, they were entitled to join this tender, it seems like, and they didn't. So um, it's not no secret that this has been happening. Uh, but yeah, I just uh, to the, to on ASO. By the way, there's a sticky bottle article on this with their their revenues from previous years. Yeah, and before the Netflix series was released, according to this article, their revenue jumped seventeen percent to five hundred and fifty million a year. And that's before the Netflix series. And after, and they, do we know that or? We don't know that yet. Okay. Um, and we also don't know the split. That's not just from the tour, by the way. That's from all their activities. They organize Dakar Rally, uh, Paris oh. Marathon. But, yeah. but no, but the cycling is, a, is, a, is at it's least a half, part. I would say, of that. So they are, and 
they also said, an ASO spokesperson told Bloomberg, the group is an independent family-owned company. We intend to remain independent in order to develop our activities with a long-term vision. You also have to bear in mind that the reason, and this, is, this goes to the Tour of Britain, so we'll cover two birds with one stone. The Tour of Britain, this is not recent, recent news. Tour of Britain uh, organizer Sweet Spot has declared, I think declared bankruptcy or is going into liquidation, which is very unfortunate. Uh, and the race is in jeopardy. British Cycling says they'd like it to continue. Ineos want to try to help that happen. Yaddy, uh, we'll see if that does happen. I have my doubts. One of the biggest problems for them and the biggest inherent benefits for mm-hmm. ASO and the Tour is, and, and in Spain, the cost of organising is so much lower. Are you yep. going to get all those police, I don't know, at, at, at cost or free, all those road closures... All of that, for that price or, or lack of price, if you're suddenly co-owned or partially owned or majority controlled by the Saudi, uh, by PIF, for if you're for ASO, example. no, no, ASO. So if oh, ASO sell ASO. 51% to the PIF. They won't do that. But if- call, Yeah, but if they did, then like surely the, all of a sudden, oh, well. Here's, here's, the, here's the invoice for how much the police cost if you want to yeah. run your race around France for three weeks is how I imagine it would go. Like it's a quid pro quo at the moment because a friend is a family, a family owned French company. But if we go back to the original problems of this entire thing that started as this breakaway league idea, like the, the teams wanting a share of the revenue from the races, like teams want the share from the revenue of the Tour de France. My question then is, because I don't exactly know the history. Has there ever been an attempt by teams to boycott the Tour de France itself? Which I know as cycling fans, we don't want to see it, but from a team's perspective... You can't. How do you, tell your, your team. how do you tell your sponsor you're going to boycott the Tour? Yeah. It's fucked, eh? Yeah, they'll be like, all right, we'll, we'll terminate our contract with you today and good luck yeah, but- paying your riders. How is your team going to like that you're doing this one cycling thing then that might impact your race schedule outside of that? Well, that's where the 250 million, we'll go back to that, that's where it doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> you would need to essentially bankroll the fact or the, guarantee the risk that they get held out of the tour, existing sponsors bail, and you yeah. now have to backstop and guarantee the existing contracts for all those riders. And it has to be more. Because they're not doing it to break even. So that's yep. where the 250, I don't, I don't know. May I, we obviously don't know what's going on. So maybe it does Speculation. make sense. Speculation. <laughs> but I've enjoyed discussing it. And certainly yeah. as I've discussed it, I've realized that in this team environment, it is very, very difficult. The way the cycling set up, it is than, uh, than with golf. So And it's pretty toxic environment. But then again, that's probably the case in happens. every sport. I mean, yeah, that's just sports, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I already mentioned Tour of Britain, um, but we'll see if that uh, happens this year. It's still on the UCI calendar. It's in a better spot, I think, this year. But as I said, the cost of organizing those events, it's not apples and apples between different countries. Like, there's a reason yep. Tour of California doesn't exist. There's a reason all the British races struggle. And there's a reason that the Australian races, if they weren't, owned and organized by a, a literal state government which has a big budget and then organizes all the policing in South Australia there's a reason why these races all ha- are able to happen in uh, the traditional cycling countries and one of those is not just audience interest it's just the cost of them happening it's the places w- a local Spanish town when the Vuelta comes to say hey we want to sponsor we want to have our stage finish here they say what can we do for you we'll 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 repaint the roads redo the roads um put a couple of extra corners in for a crazy finish we'll let us roll out the red carpet and we'll pay you in california it sounded like when you wanted to go through a town the the mayor or whatever was like that's going to cost x and you're gonna have to fill out a million pieces of paperwork um i might be simplifying it but that's a general theme 